Welcome to Dig, the History Podcast. On a brisk autumn day in New York City, 1968, Roughly 13 women spent the morning of October 31st dressing in black cloaks and dresses. They stuck feathers, leaves, and furs in their long hair. One woman grabbed her enormous hat, roughly in the shape of a costume witch hat, but instead of a pointy top, it sported a papier-mâché pig's head on a plate surrounded by dollar bills. These women were members of WITCH, the Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell, and they were about to jump onto their broomsticks and fly into the history books. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Marissa. And we are your historians for this episode of Dig. On October 31st, 1968, women's liberation adherents invaded the dour male domain of Wall Street in order to place a hex on New York's financial district. The women chanted, Wall Street, Wall Street, mightiest wall of Wall Street, trick or treat, corporate elite, up against the Wall Street. They called upon mystic forces to hex the Dow Jones Industrial Average which I might point out did drop unexpectedly the following day. Pictures captured by Bev Grant, an activist, musician, and photographer of the 1960s movement, show a group of young white women having fun while making a political statement. Most pronounced in Grant's photographs is Rosalind Baxendahl, who wears a black cape with which is the original women gorilla, emblazoned in bold letters on the back, a white paper mache skull affixed at shoulder level. Her co-conspirators, draped in shawls and costumes, pass out leaflets to bemused men and women. They were there to protest the class struggle between the rich and the poor. It was a condemnation of American capitalism. Although they did not make the focus of this initial protest solely about the struggle against male oppression, the fact that they were protesting as women and embracing this image of the witch as a feminine source of power was radical in itself. Soon after the hex on Wall Street, witch covens sprang up across the country most prominently in Chicago and Washington, D.C., but also in Boston, San Francisco, Portland, Oregon, and Austin, Texas. Leaflets passed out by New York Witch maintained that, quote, Witch is an all-woman everything. It's theater, revolution, magic, terror, joy, garlic flowers, spells. It's an awareness that witches and gypsies were the original guerrillas and resistance fighters against oppression. There is no joining witch. If you are a woman and dare to look within yourself, you are a witch. Whatever is repressive, solely male-oriented, greedy, puritanical, authoritarian, those are your targets. Like the larger radical women's movement, witch was based on collectivity, with a witch leaflet stating, The power of the coven is more than the sum of its individual members because it is together. Robin Morgan professed that witch was a phenomenon in itself within the women's liberation movement, and each coven had its own style and focus. Witch claimed the subversive identity of witch in order to overcome the deleterious effects of the witchcraft purges of the Middle Ages, and to take a term meant as an insult and embrace it instead, a move they borrowed from the Black Liberation Movement. However, claiming the label witch in this case was a political act of resistance, and their protests, called zaps, were feminist street theater with a powerful message. This was not an embrace of witchcraft or goddess worship in general, although many in the women's liberation movement did gravitate towards goddess worship in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, which Sarah touches on a bit in her episode. 
The original New York City witch coven formed from the group New York Radical Women, NYRW, that, according to historian Eccles, was in the midst of an internal politico-feminist schism. Politicos believed that women's liberation should work alongside and from within the left, while radical feminists felt they had to forge a separatist route, focused on raising the awareness of women to their own oppression so that they could be organized into a collective class movement. It's important to highlight the connection between the women's rights movement, the civil rights movement, and the new left in general during this time. Many women's liberation organizers had participated in movement organizing and brought valuable skills and knowledge from that work. This also meant that some organizers had deep ties to socialist leftist principles and resisted women's liberation becoming a separate standalone movement. Others saw how the Black Power movement was moving away from the Civil Rights Movement, creating a standalone movement by Black people for Black people without white interference. Some women's liberation members felt that this was the best approach for women's liberation as well. Basically, many early women's liberation meetings broke down to the question, is our oppression capitalism or is our oppression men? Radical women in the NYRW utilized a tool they called consciousness raising, where women shared their personal experiences and testimonies. By sharing these experiences aloud, other women were able to understand that the struggles in their own lives were not individual problems, but societal issues. The group used these personal experiences to examine the root of women's so-called personal problems and understand that they're actually societal problems that take collective action to fix. Peggy Dobbins shared her experience of being involved in the consciousness raising group, saying, quote, by sharing personal experiences, we were discovering we weren't crazy, end quote. Judy Pamela Allen recalled, quote, the topic I remember being personally profound was relationships to men. Somebody was commenting about her boyfriend saying something to her and everybody in the group went, oh, my God, that's exactly what mine says to me. If women are all being accused of being too emotional, what does that mean? End quote. I guess to our modern ears, this seems strange in a way. Like, how were these women not discussing these things with each other already, right? Um, But they weren't, I guess. So they were expected to keep up the myth of the perfect daughter, wife, mother. So these consciousness raising sessions were really revolutionary for a lot of women. And again, going back to Sarah's episode in this series, she gives an example of how frank discussions among her female cohorts in college were revolutionary for how she thought about sex and normalcy. So this idea of consciousness raising is still an important tool in overcoming oppression. In the late 1960s, radical women in the NYRW struggled with this internal question over whether women should work with men on the left or build their own separate movement. Should they focus on theory and consciousness raising or direct action? These debates led the NYRW to split into various subgroups. The NYRW ended up becoming kind of an umbrella organization for radical women, with some politicos splitting off to participate with which, who wanted to do action, and others gravitating towards the Red Stockings, a group of radical feminists whose name was a nod to the disparaging label Blue Stockings given to early women intellectuals and Red for Revolution. Listen to my episode on Blue Stockings and gendered insults in Britain if you want more information on that. The Red Stockings became famous when they disrupted a New York state legislature hearing on abortion, which had a panel of, quote, expert witnesses that included 14 men and a nun. Red Stockings organized a speak out in West Village where the real experts, women who had actually experienced abortions, spoke before a large crowd. A link to the audio of that speak out is in the transcript of this episode on our blog, digpodcast.org. You can go check it out. You can see this internal argument between a focus on capitalism and a focus on women's oppression playing out in some of the witch writings. For example, the New York Coven writes, quote, You are pledged to free our brothers from oppression and stereotype sexual roles, whether they like it or not, as well as ourselves, end quote. So the witch politicos, who in 1968 and early 1969 still wanted to organize with men and the left, and this argument also played out in the very first witch zap on Wall Street that emphasized the working class struggle against capitalism, 
not necessarily the women's liberation movement. However, as most women politicos in the women's liberation movement experienced the intransigence of the left and the old guard not taking them seriously, they began naming sexism as the central source of their oppression. Morgan's famous essay, Goodbye to All That, called out the sexism of the left and the misogyny of the everyday man, especially the ones that claim to support quote-unquote women's lib, as they disparagingly called it, while they made sexual jokes and relegated women to the typewriter and kitchen duty. Subsequently, politicos who originally aligned more with the left and a criticism of capitalism began moving towards the radical feminists who were focused on male supremacy as being the ultimate oppressor. After the zap on Wall Street, subsequent witch zaps happened across the country, and the witch acronym could be morphed into whatever suited the zap best. In one iteration, witch became women inspired to commit herstory when they protested the treatment of Black Panther women held in the New Haven Niantic Women's Jail. The Panther women were held in solitary confinement under armed guards and lights shining in their cells 24 hours a day. Erica Huggins, who we talk about extensively in our Black Panther episode, was one of the women held in solitary confinement. Other Panther women, Frances Carter and Rose Smith, were forced to give birth under armed guard in the prison and were denied prenatal care. News of their treatment brought a multiracial coalition of over 3,000 women to New Haven in November of 1969 in protest. A witch coven joined in these protests, and this is before Carter and Smith had given birth. So the witch hex uh, includes the, the foreshadowing of these births. And here's a snippet of the witch hex. Guards will be there when the babies are born. Guards will be there to take them away. The state will decide who's fit and who's not fit to guard and be guardian of mother and child. Therefore, witch curses the state and declares it unfit. Oppressors, the curse of women is on you. When AT&T fired two typists who refused to be called girls and insisted they be called women, which became women incensed at telephone company harassment, which I think that's great. <laughs> um, it just fits so well. Um, they wrote in their leaflet for, for this protest zap, Quote, how does a girl become a woman when she defines her own life and stop being controlled by her family, her boyfriend, or her boss, when she learns to stand up and fight for herself and other women because she has learned that her problems aren't just her own, end quote. So again, highlighting the collective action necessary for real change. In a witch card from Hellmark, <laughs> it's so corny. I like it, though. Um, which became women interested in toppling consumption holidays and encouraged the mothers in their lives to renounce your martyrdom, become a liberated mother. And then my favorite hex by the witch, women's independent taxpayers, consumers, and homemakers. Double bubble, war and rubble. When you mess with women, you'll be in trouble. We're convicted of murder if abortion is planned. Convicted of shame if we don't have a man. Convicted of conspiracy if we fight for our rights. And burned at the stake when we stand up to fight. Double bubble, war and rubble. When you mess with women, you'll be in trouble. We curse your empire to make it fall. When you take on one of us, you take on us all. I like that one too. Not everyone in the women's liberation movement was impressed with the zaps and theatrics of which... Radical feminists like Kathy Sarah Child and Carol Hainish, both organizers of the 1968 Miss America pageant protest, felt that the witch theatrics were an attempt to keep up with the members of the Youth International Party, known as Yippies. Yippies performed political street theater and pranks, famously running Pegasus, the Immortal, a pig, for president in 1968. Witch theatrics seemed to go a bit too far in one of their last zaps. In February of 1969, 10,000 stickers stating Confront the Whoremongers appeared all over New York City in advance of the New York Bridal Fair. On the day of the event, witch demonstrators showed up wearing black veils singing, Here come the slaves, off to their graves, and carrying signs that said, Always a bride, never a person. 
They were protesting both the oppressive elements of marriage, but also the sheer consumerism of the whole wedding complex, the quote-unquote need for a full china set and 18,000 different kinds of linens. Which demonstrators performed an unwedding ceremony in the morning, declaring themselves in the name of revolution, free human beings? Later in the day, they released 150 white mice onto the show floor, but instead of running and screaming like the witches had hoped, the bridal show participants actually tried to save the mice from getting stepped on. Instead of endearing themselves to the very women they were trying to reach, witch zaps like this tended to antagonize other women with an attitude of, I'm woke and you're not, or in the term of the day, I'm liberated and you're not. Not surprisingly, women attending the bridal show didn't like being called slaves and whores. After the bridal fair, which turned towards more consciousness-raising activities, like their radical feminist sisters, they still operated under the banner of the NYRW. Morgan later wrote of the witch theatric, saying it was clownish proto-anarchism and had not quote, raised our own consciousness very far out of our own combat boots, end quote. She looked back at the emulation of groups such as the Yippies as disastrous. However, she wrote, quote, we were also, in all fairness, newly aroused and angry about our own oppression as women, and we wanted to move. It seemed intolerable that we should sit around just talking when there was so much to be done. So we went out and did it, end quote. Many activists involved with which participated in other feminist actions and organization. Heather Booth, a witch activist in Chicago, was one of the originators of the Jane Collective, a large Chicago-based underground service that provided underground safe abortions in the years 1969 to 1973, prior to Roe v. Wade. And we discussed the Jane Collective a little bit in our episode, Birth Control and Abortion, before Roe v. Wade. Other witches continued to be leaders in the women's liberation movement. Even as witch zaps faded away, the women of which continued to fight for the radical women's movement. And also, just to be clear, the lines between witch, the Red Stockings, and other organizations were not clearly defined. Many members of the various NYRW subgroups participated in both groups. So up to this point, we've really been talking about a small contingent of radical feminists in the women's rights movement as an important part of second wave feminism. The other and more prominent faction was liberal feminists, represented by the National Organization for Women, NOW, and prominent women like Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem. Liberal feminists were and are committed to working within the system, that is, getting more women elected to office, more women as CEOs of large companies, etc., Now, Statement of Purpose put it to bring women into full participation in the mainstream of American society, largely by means of equal pay and equal representation. Whereas radical feminists argued that women constituted a sex class, that relations between men and women needed to be recast in political terms, and that gender rather than class was the primary axis of oppression. According to radical feminist Joe Freeman, Women's liberation does not mean equality with men, because equality in an unjust society is meaningless. Radical feminists coined terms that we are familiar with today, like the personal is political and sisterhood is powerful. They also produced much of the must-read second-wave feminist texts, such as Anne Coates' The Myth of the Vaginal Orgasm, Pat Minardi's The Politics of Houseworth, Shulamith Firestone's The Dialectic of Sex, Carol Hanish's The Personal is Political, Kate Millett's Sexual Politics, and Susan Brown Miller's Against Our Will. These foundational texts and others laid the foundation for women's studies programs in universities across the country. Over time, liberal feminists began adopting some of the views and practices of radical feminists. For example, Liberal feminists adopted consciousness raising, something Betty Friedan had once chastised as navel gazing. It's pretty hard to imagine for those of us born after the sweeping changes brought about because of second wave feminism, what it was like for women in the movement. 
I think one of the hardest things to understand or to wrap my brain around was how women just didn't talk about their own oppression or politics in general the way we do today. I mean, that's especially true for me because I'm a big talker. I can't imagine (laughs) not telling everyone everything I think. Um, (laughs) Prominent writer and feminist activist Alex Cates Schulman said this about her introduction to the women's liberation movement. Quote, I was home in Manhattan with my children when I heard these women on the radio talking about NYRW and this thing they called women's liberation. I was a perfect specimen of who they were trying to reach, a genuine housewife. I'd had to leave my job as an encyclopedia editor when I got pregnant because back then there was no maternity leave. The thing that was so shocking to me was that these women were talking with authority about politics. I'd only ever heard men talk that way, end quote. As women became more aware of their own place within the larger protest movement in the late 60s and 70s, the women's liberation movement grew and their anger mounted. In an oral interview for the documentary, She's Beautiful When She's Angry, Ruth Rosen, historian and author of the feminist history, The World Split Open, explained how male oppression colored every aspect of women's lives. Speaking of her experience in academia, she said, quote, I was in the history department and I knew zip, not a zero about women's history. And we realized we didn't know very much about women's literature or women's art. In fact, we realized that we had gotten degrees and we knew nothing about women. End quote. So they did something that is kind of terrifying and totally badass, at least to me. Uh, She got a group of women together with their advanced degrees. So PhDs, master's degrees, and they called the press and they took these degrees and they publicly burned them. But the reason they did this was because they were angry. Uh, Rosen said she, quote, felt duped, like I had been fooled my whole life. Can you imagine going to college now and not learning any women's history? Yeah. I mean, even an engineering student or something is going to at least take a general education history or English literature class and get exposed to some women's history and intellectualism. And if you're a liberal arts major, it's more than likely a major theme in at least some of the classes you take. It's just really hard to imagine life without women's intellectualism and history being a major part of our world. I mean, maybe especially for us because we're feminist historians. And what's even crazier, though, is that you had women who got advanced degrees and went through all of this school, women who who never once saw themselves reflected in history ever, and then graduated, and then were like, crap, I've never... But, you know, it's also it's also the same with people of color. Right. And so that's that's right. also something that happens out of this whole 60s and 70s movement as then, you know, we start having, uh, you know, African-American studies in schools and the Chicano movement brings Chicano studies into into schools. So mm-hmm. um, it's an explosion, really, of 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 what all of America looks like at this time. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say like we're perfect or anything like that, but mm-hmm. it's crazy to think of how it was beforehand. No, I know what you mean. Right. And economic structures, too. Now, of course, we have light years to go as far as universal child care and the gender pay gap. But really, there are huge strides that have been taken. I mean, women couldn't even open up a credit card in their own names. They couldn't buy a house or a car in their own names. They were flat out told that they couldn't be hired or accepted to an education program or whatever because they were female. So although we are still fighting, we also have to acknowledge the huge strides that have been made thanks to the angers, the zaps, the consciousness raising, and the hell raising by second wave feminists. So it's kind of cool now to bash second wave feminism, just as it's cool to bash first wave feminism as too white, too middle class, too stuffy, etc. However, sociologist Benita Roth eloquently chronicles the development of feminisms among U.S.-based women of color in her book, Separate Roads to Feminism. She shows how feminists of color created their own spaces within a larger movement of second wave feminism, while also highlighting the real blocks that racial inequalities had on the possibilities for feminism. Union. Additionally, the media and America's right turn in the 1970s and 80s cast dispersion on the feminist movement. 
overshadowing radical feminists' insistence that the society had to change entirely in order to work for everybody, both white women and women of color. In 2013, Rosen wrote a response to the viral article written by Annie Marie Slaughter. Uh, And in Slaughter's essay, she chronicled the high-profile and high-stress job that she had um, in her quest to quote-unquote have it all. So meaning the job outside of the home and the husband and the children and the great sex life, etc., etc., And Slaughter complained that even though she had a helpful husband and the means to pay for domestic help and child care, she still couldn't manage the guilt she felt for not doing it all perfectly. Rosen countered that, quote, having it all was never what women's liberation wanted. Radical feminists wanted society to change so that women wouldn't have to try to do it all. In a reconstructed society, men would do their half and women would have more options than working for wages while also bearing the brunt of domestic and childcare duties. Rosen reminds us that this radical vision was for all women, not just elite white women who could afford to hire women of color to clean their houses and watch their children while they managed to, quote, have it all. By 1970, which was dead. Most of its members moved on to other groups and actions. However, the interest in reclaiming the term witch as a positive term took on new meaning as women in the 1970s and onward began practicing witchcraft, Wicca, or some other form of goddess worship inspired by the female-centered feminist writings of women like Starhawk, who wrote The Spiral Dance in 1979, and Margot Adler's Drawing Down the Moon, also printed in 1979. Today, many practicing Wiccans, witches, and neo-pagans consider themselves as practicing in the feminist tradition. In more recent times, images of a new wave of political witches has appeared at resistance rallies since the election of Donald Trump. Witch PDX and Witch Boston profess, quote, to follow the spirit of the original witch protests and strive to enhance political consciousness through public rituals, protests, and raising awareness of concerns in our communities around the city of Boston as well as the country at large, end quote. So what do you think about the association of witches with the feminist movement and with subversion and everything? Um, for me, as like a historian who has researched a lot about early modern history, I have spent a lot of my time focusing on kind of breaking down that um, mainstream narrative, which is about women who were persecuted for being women um, and uh, which is being like a term of which is being people who were weak in society or something. You know, there are a lot of historians fighting back against that, that witches, early modern witches I'm talking during witch hunts and things like that, were sometimes self-consciously they were witches and they were practicing witches and they were proud of being witches. Um, Others wouldn't have considered themselves witches, um, but, you know, felt um, powerful in some other kind of way. I guess my question is associating feminism, especially women's libs specifically, with witches, is that like continuing the idea that all early modern witches were like, like, super oppressed women? I mean, I guess they were because it's the early modern period. So they all were. But... No, I mean, I think what they're doing is they're trying to I mean, it's like, so like in the black power movement, like they're reclaiming the word black. Right. And I mean, now more you could say like the N word, Mm -hmm. you know, like people are reclaiming that word. People of color are reclaiming that word. So, you know, in a way, they're like finding power in a word that had been uh, of of a group of women who had been, you know, reviled in a sense. I mean, literally burned at the stake for just being women. Right. And so it's like an act of, of power, so to speak. Now, I mean, I... I listened to Sarah's episode and it was so fascinating breaking down the historiography of the um, centrality of our understanding of witches to the second to second wave feminism. 
And so I didn't necessarily want to go there too much in this one um, because I, I don't know. I mean, I just I learned a lot. I learned a lot from her from her her episode. So I more wanted to focus in this episode just like on the actual politics of it and not necessarily. I don't get the sense that they were really studying witches right. at all. It was more just like here here is something that has been used to put down women and we're going to take it and we're going to make it powerful and we're going to dress up as witches and we're going to act a fool to make people notice what we're saying you know right yeah like so instead of that's what i'm saying like i think now historians are trying to kind of tear down that whole trope of the witch and say actually that's not really that accurate as to what it was like at the time blah 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 but they weren't caring about the accuracy to the no, historical and I'm not con- like they're they're caring more about it as as a cultural phenomenon. right and I'm not really necessarily that worried about it for this episode either like I'm more interested in it as as a as a form of power and protest right but I think that that could be used against second wave feminists for sure like I mean I listened to Sarah's episode too and parts of it make me nervous because it's it's easy to discount the um to discount an entire idea because it's based on bad history or something. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've seen in history groups people being like, well, actually, that's not how it was or whatever, even though someone's just trying to make a point with some meme or whatever. Um, I guess it uh, makes me feel like it makes, that's one of the reasons why people are so critical of second wave feminism is because of those... I don't know. I wouldn't say so. I mean, I think people are more critical of second wave feminism because it's, A, a movement by women, and B, you know, as we learn more about it and we see some of the shortfalls of, you know, white feminists' um, outlook on feminism, it's it's a way for us to criticize them the, uh, in ways that we don't criticize other movements of the time that were just as short-sighted. So I actually, I actually completely disagree. Mm-hmm. I don't think the history of witchcraft really has that much to do with second wave feminism at all, as far as like the historiography being revised, because it's not like these women were writing the history books. They were just reading what was written at the time and, and using it to the best of their knowledge. Yeah, no, but I mean, my whole episode was about was about that the whole, the reason that people just pretend that male witches don't exist or pretend that all witches were women, which is one hundred percent not true, is because of its association with second wave feminism. Is what I'm saying. I mean, yes and no, because you're also talking about historians doing work mm-hmm. and not and not these these activist feminism feminists doing the work, right? So right. Who are concern- more concerned about, like, popular culture and popular history. But also, these feminists are the ones that are able to bring a look at women into the academy, right? So before that, you're not even looking at women. You're not even analyzing why women are being burned at the stake. I mean, it's it's just, I mean, there's no, like, analytical or deep intellectual thought about studying women as a class, Right. And so that's what radical feminists are trying to do as they're trying to study women as a class. Right. And so that's why and this is something I didn't necessarily want to get into, but I think we have to go there now. That's why some I do not want to say all, but that's why radical feminism now some are in this debate with intersectionality and with this turn towards gender. Right. Because Mm -hmm. they feel that it has flattened the uh the the analysis of women's oppression by adding in intersectionality of homosexuality and trans rights and this that and the other that you know they're not saying that those things don't matter Mm -hmm. they're saying that in the analysis of women and women's oppression too many axes flatten the curve i'm not saying i agree or disagree but that's that's like where we've gotten Mm -hmm. you know yeah, I've definitely seen that debate going on and many accusations of people being TERFs and things like that because right. they, like, bring up that 
concern. Right. And yes, it's very, very fractious. Right, <laughs> right. So, I mean, I mean, I guess which goes to say, like, you know, this stuff is very relevant still. It's like it's still being contested and relevant. And I think there's still an association between witches and feminism. Like, I mean, you know, how many times have we, you know, we call our our we are fe- have a feminist podcast and we call some of our followers our coven. You know what I mean? Right. Well, because it's, I mean, again, I think it's because it's like we're we're claiming something that is like women centric and women powerful, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And it's it's an image of a powerful woman who is controlling her own destiny, controlling her own body, controlling the world around her. You know, right? Not and doing s- what she's told, kind of. Right. Thing. Right. 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 Yeah. Which, no, no, I get it. You know, it. It, I mean, it's sure a cartoonish characterization of it, but it's also in for, a form, a, I think, a fun form of empowerment. And why not? And I think mm-hmm. that that's also what Witch was doing in in the in the late sixties. You know, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And I love I love uh, uh, Robin Morgan saying, you know, but we needed to do something. You know, we were young, mm-hmm. we were newly woke. And we needed to act, mm-hmm. and and they did, and I think it's great. Yeah, I think it's easy to criticize looking back and being like, oh, well, they right. shouldn't have done this, and they should have done it this way. Right. But um, I get it. I mean, I get the desire to act and not just sit around and talking about it. Like, you know, I get it. But, you know, but on the other hand, consciousness raising did a lot, so... I don't want to discount that. No, I love the um, Miss America pageant uh, um, theatricals. That's one of my most favorite right. things to teach. <laughs> they did a oh, they did an auction fun. of like they auctioned off a woman like as if she was a piece of beef. You know, it was it's super interesting. Yeah. So that happened before this, and it was like the impetus for which. But it's mm-hmm. so famous that I really wanted to open up with the the New York City zap as opposed to opening up with with Miss mm-hmm. America because you can find anything on Miss America, but there's not that much on which mm-hmm. necessarily. No, not at but all. I'd act- I'd never heard of it. You guys should check out. I mean the you know the new witch that are now at like Black Lives Matter protests and resistance protests like. They look awesome. And so definitely wanted to, like, put some pictures of of them on our blog just because they look badass. (laughs) Yes. And you should go look. That does. It does sound like fun. It's something I would totally be down for. (laughs) Yeah. I know. I was kind of thinking, like, hmm. (laughs) It's supposed to. See, it's supposed to be anonymous and secret. So. Oh, really? So you have to be, like, disguised? Well, you just. there. You'll look at the pictures. Their faces are covered. But, yeah, it's. It's like it's, okay. it's which is everyone and no one. Do you know what I mean? So anyway, so I would say, yeah, mm-hmm. we should start a witch mm-hmm. coven, but yet we're not because it's secret. <laughs> yes. Yeah, except we're All not. Right. She's just kidding. Um okay, so take a look um at our blog, digpodcast.org, um, and you can look at the new pictures of the newest witches if you'd like um make sure to follow us on twitter and facebook maybe join our facebook group um dig history pod squad we basically just share memes and make really dorky jokes um and please leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to our podcast um they really really help us yes, thank become you. more visible so to others. have a safe and patriarchy smashing halloween bye Bye. All right. End quote. It largely... Wait. Wait, okay. Now statement of purpose to put it... (laughs) There you go. You did it. (laughs) It's Friday. On our blog, Dig Dig Podcast got... Oh, my God. On our blog, dig pod. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Why am I struggling with this? Okay, listen to Marissa's episode on blue stockings and Britain. Shouldn't you for say lesson of mine? The red stockings. <laughs> Correct. Maybe, I probably maybe. should. <laughs> okay, third person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my god. A woman, a mother, not a, not a mom. Oh wait. Whoops. 
However, the interest in reclaiming the term, which as a positive that term... Should have. Wait. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> that makes so much more sense. Okay. 